and admit all. Ready? Mm -hmm. Sure. Greetings, everyone. I see folks pouring in. Greetings. Hello. Feel Hi. free to put your name, agency, county in the chat just to give us a general idea of who's here. My name is Alex Carpenter. I'm the Western Region Youth Partner with Youth Power of Families Together in New York State. Um, and this is our second part of a six part series about substance use disorder, um, some of the various like niches uh, that kind of go along with it, right? Um, so uh, if you joined us on September 3rd, uh, you would have seen the Pathways to Panel, uh, Pathways to Recovery panel discussion, which was really neat. A few of us talked about some of the various different pathways we tried um, as we got into recovery and sustained recovery. Um, and so today uh, we have Julie Dealing, um, the Central Region Youth Partner, and Caitlin O'Brien, the Long Island Regional Youth Partner, um, who have put together a presentation about trauma and the correlation between substance use disorder, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the floor over to them. Thank you, Alex. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Dealing. And I'm Caitlin O'Brien. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, childhood trauma specifically and substance use disorders. Um, we do want to put like a trigger warning. Um, some of the stuff that we talk about hopefully won't get too heavy, but just in case, we just want to throw that out there. And we will also have a coworker of ours joining at the end to lead us in some meditation. So that way everybody can leave feeling refreshed and okay. So I just wanted to start by saying that. Um, so let's get started. So what is trauma? Um, it is defined as an event, series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening um, and has a lasting adverse effect on the individual's function and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Um, more than two thirds of children reported at least one traumatic event by the age of 16. Potentially traumatic events include psychological, physical, or sexual abuse, community or school violence, witnessing or experiencing domestic violence, um, national or national disasters or terrorism, commercial sexual exploitation, sudden loss of or violent loss of a loved one, refugee or war experiences, military family related stressors such as deploy military family related stressors such as de deployment, physical uh, parental loss or injury, physical or sexual assault neglect and serious accidents or life-threatening illnesses. So um, I have my own personal experience with um, childhood trauma. Um, I was um, sexually abused by a female cousin from four to 12. Um, and like as a way of protecting myself, my brain kind of repressed these memories for a long time. Um, and it showed as um, anger and anxiety, um, depression. I was always, I remember being a lot sadder than um, most kids my age would be um, during situations. Um, I never wanted to be away from my parents. Um, I was afraid um, to be away from them. I had such a hate towards my cousin and had no idea why, neither did anyone else in my family. Um, and the memories didn't show up until um, I was 18 after my first experience with sexual assault, which is common um, in childhood um, trauma. You're more likely to be traumatized again later on in life. Um, unfortunately, it happened to me um, another time after when I was 20. 
um, as far as the childhood um, stuff, I started coping with it in my own way. Um, I would self-harm. I would, I started drinking young, um, but still none of these things came to be known for what I was actually going through and I kept it hidden for a long time. Um, the impact of childhood traumatic stress can last well beyond childhood. Um, I still experience it as an adult. Um, in fact, research has shown that childhood trauma survivors may experience learning problems, including lower grades and more suspensions and expulsions, increased use of health and mental health services, um, increased involvement in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems, long-term health problems such as diabetes, heart disease, um, and trauma is a risk, risk factor for nearly all behavioral health and substance use disorders. Um, when I was in elementary school, I got diagnosed with a learning disability. Um, looking back and through my work with therapy, um, I'm starting to realize it may not have been a learning disability at all. Um, trauma affects the way your brain functions and works. And I'm starting to see that it might have been more of a um, trauma brain rather than a learning disability. Um, increased involvement, oops, sorry. Increased involvement in the mental health system. I'm borderline personality disorder, PTSD and depression. And that's my experience in the mental health system. Thank you, Caitlin. So what is substance use? So the term substance use refers to the use of drugs or alcohol, and that can include cigarettes, illegal drugs, prescription medications, inhalants, and solvents. Um, and we're talking about this today because a substance use problem, um, which is when the use of alcohol or other drugs causes harm to you or the people around you, those problems can lead to addiction. Um, so as Caitlin mentioned, and how she has experience with childhood trauma, I also have experience with childhood trauma. I was also molested by a family member and um, similar to Caitlin, those memories were suppressed and I didn't understand, you know, why at five years old I'm being diagnosed with anxiety and at 14 with depression um, until I was much older and um, other things had continued to happen. And by the time I was 14, I was smoking marijuana, smoking cigarettes, drinking regularly, um, you know, in abusive relationships, et cetera. So how do those two things correlate? We have um, a video here that hopefully I can get to work. <laughs> Um, one second. Okay, sorry about that. Let me pause this really quick. Um, Caitlin, would you like to kind of just go further into how childhood trauma leads into addiction while I get this video to work? Um, childhood trauma can lead into addiction just for self-medicating purposes. Um, the more you think about the, um, event, it could just lead into using any substance as a form of, um, coping, uh, drinking to, um, suppress the nightmares you may be having. Um, for me personally, I would drink to help myself feel better, help numb the pain of the memories. Um, like Julie mentioned, I started smoking marijuana very young too. Um, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd just because it felt different than who I was normally hanging out with. Oh, you got it to work. Yes, yeah, so let me just make sure that the video, the sound is being shared. Okay. Can you hear that, Caitlin? So an addiction is a complex 
psychological, physiological process, but which manifests in any behavior, any behavior that a person enjoys, that a person enjoys, finds relief in, and therefore craves in the short term, but suffers negative consequences in the long term and doesn't give up despite the negative consequences. So craving pleasure, relief in the short term, negative consequences in the long term, inability to give it up. Now, notice I has said nothing about substances. I said any behavior. So it could be related to cocaine, crystal meth, heroin, fentanyl, marijuana, nicotine, alcohol, whatever. Could also be sex, gambling, internet, relationships, shopping, eating, work, extreme sports, working out, um, pornography, any number of uh, human activities. So I said any behavior. Now, the official definition of addiction, according to the American um, Society for Addiction Medicine, is that this is primary a brain, it's a primary brain disorder. It arises in the brain, well, largely due to genetic reasons. This is how they see it. And I say that's just not true. Uh, the other popular idea about addiction is that it's a choice that somebody makes, that people choose to be addicted, which is what the legal system is based on. Because if people are not choosing, what are we punishing them for? And, and uh, although I think the medical definition is closer to the truth, I don't see it as a genetic, it's a genetic disorder, and I don't see it as a primary brain disorder. So let me perhaps show you why, if that's okay. A human being has two fundamental needs, apart from the physical needs in infancy, in childhood. One is for attachment. <clears throat> now, attachment is the closeness and proximity with another human being for the sake of being looked after or for the sake of looking after the other. Now, human beings as mammals and even birds are creatures of attachment. We have to connect and attach because otherwise we don't survive. If there's nobody that's motivated to take care of us, to attach to us that way, and we're not motivated to attach to others, we just can't survive. One of the interesting things is, is that the endorphins, which um, are the body's internal opiate make, uh, chemicals, which heroin and all the other opiates resemble, they help to facilitate attachment. So if you take infant mice and you knock out their endorphin receptors so they don't have endorphin opiate activity in their brain, they won't cry for help and separate from their mothers, which would mean that they would die in the wild. And which goes back to what happens in early in childhood when there's stress and trauma, these, uh, these endorphin systems don't develop. And then when people do heroin, it feels like a warm, soft hug to them. They feel love and connection for the first time. That's why it's so powerful. But so we have this need for attachment, without which obviously the human infant, who is the most hopeless, the most dependent, the least mature of any creature in the universe at birth, uh, cannot survive without the attachment. And that attachment relationship, given that we have the longest period of development of any creature, you know, well into adolescence and, and beyond, attachment is not a negotiable need. But we have another need, which is authenticity. Now, authenticity, out of the self, means being connected to ourselves, just knowing what we feel and being able to act on it. So that means our gut feelings. So let's look at how human beings evolved. For hundreds of thousands of years, and for a hundred thousand years or so of this species existing on Earth, how did we live? We didn't live in cities and houses and so on. We lived there out there in the wild until very recently in human um, existence. Now, just how long do you survive in the wild if you're not connected to your gut feelings? Not very long. If you start using your intellect instead of your gut feelings, you just don't survive. So that's a powerful survival need as well. So attachment is a survival need. Authenticity is a survival need. But what happens if your authenticity threatens your attachment relationships? For example, as a two-year-old, you get angry because you didn't get that cookie before dinner. But your parents can't handle anger because they grew up in homes when there was rageaholism and they're terrified at the very expression of anger. So they give you the message that good little kids don't get angry. The message you receive is not that good little kids don't get angry, but that angry little kids don't get loved. Because your parents are now sullen, they won't look at you, they talk to you in a harsh way, you're not getting loved. Not experiencing love at that moment. No, but you gotta stay attached. Guess what you're gonna suppress? The authenticity every time. 
And this is how we lose connection to ourselves and to our gut feelings. So that, strangely enough, that very dynamic, which is essential for human survival in a natural setting, not becomes a threat to our survival in this in this more modern setting, where to stay authentic is to threaten attachment. And so we give up our authenticity, and then we wonder who the hell we are, and whose life is this, and who's experiencing all this, and this life doesn't... F- you know, and who am I really? And so that's where the reconnection has to happen. That's where the healing happens is with that reconnection. But it's because of that conflict, that tragic conflict in childhood between authenticity and attachment that most of us face, that we lose ourselves and lose connection to our gut feelings. Now, this leads to the uh, the question of trauma, because <clears throat> it's one thing to recognize that all this originates in childhood pain. It's quite another to transform that pain. And for that, we have to understand what trauma is. So people often think that trauma is what happens to you. So trauma is a divorce when you were small and your parents fighting. Trauma is your mother's depression. Trauma is your father's alcoholism. Trauma is your parents' argumentation. Trauma is physical or sexual abuse or some loss. Those aren't the traumas. Those are traumatic. But the trauma is not what happens to you. The trauma is what happens inside you. And as a result of these traumatic events, what happens inside you is you get get disconnected from your emotions and you disconnect from your body. And you have difficulty being in the present moment. And you develop a negative view of your world and a negative view of yourself and a defensive view of other people. And these perspectives keep showing up in your life in the present So in other words, the addiction is not the primary problem. It's an attempt to solve a problem. And then the real question is, how did the problem arise? In other words, this is where my theory is that it's always rooted in childhood trauma Mm -hmm. and that the addiction is an attempt to deal with the effects of childhood trauma, which it does temporarily, Mm -hmm. while it creates even more problems in the long term. And so the issue is not just to recognize what happened 10, 15, 30, however many years ago, but to actually recognize their manifestations in the present moment and to transcend them. And how do you do that? By reconnecting with yourself, by restoring the connection with your body primarily and with your emotions that you lost. <clears throat> and once you do, when you found these things again, then you have what we call recovery. Because what does it mean to recover something? It means to find it again. So what is it that people find when they recover? They find themselves. And the loss of self is the essence of trauma. So the real purpose of, uh, of, of addiction treatment, mental health treatment, any kind of healing is reconnection. Okay, so I know that that video was kind of long and had a lot of information in it. Um, but overall, the idea that we lose a part of ourselves throughout our traumatic events is really like what I was hoping our audience would take away and understanding that when you have these childhood traumatic events, that it changes the way that your brain works and it changes the way that you think, um, not only about yourself, but the world and growing up, especially not getting some of those um, supports and resources that you need like immediately, that can be really difficult to figure out. So then you can find these things that temporarily release dopamine in your brain, the dopamine that's no longer there because these traumatic events took it away from you because that fight or flight mode is always going. You're always in survival mode. So these, these things that maybe your friends are doing and you're like, okay, and you don't understand why you have a problem and they don't, like you did it the same amount of times, you know, it's because it's delivering that dopamine that you otherwise wouldn't have. So what I really like to take away from this video is at the end when he says that to recover is to find that missing part. So I'm just going to share my screen again really quick, put it back on the PowerPoint. Okay. So that leads into the fact that we want to talk about the recovery part. 
we understand that everybody goes through traumatic events throughout their life, whatever that looks like for you. And we all have things that we have coped with, whether they're positive or negative. And we want to focus on that recovery is possible, whether you have a substance use disorder or you have a mental health challenge or you have some other type of addiction, recovery is possible. And SAMHSA defines recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. But how do we do that? If you are really deep and you, you know, you're done, but you don't know where to start, how do you do that? So today, Caitlin and I wanted to talk to you about safety planning. Safety planning is something that I use for myself. I use for every single young person that I work with. Um, now, the YPAs that I work with, I recommend that they use them for the young people that they work with. I think that it, this is a really solid place to begin. So having a plan um, having a safety plan is essentially just having a plan for the unexpected. Because unfortunately, you know, the world doesn't stop around you and you can't hide from everything that might trigger you. So this plan assists you in being prepared to handle those situations that otherwise might have you return to old habits. So um, we're going to go over some parts that you might put in a safety plan. And again, this can be, some of these questions are specific to substance use. However, safety plans, I believe everybody should have one and they can be used for anything. Um, and they are a living document. They can always be changed if something needs to be changed. Um, and they're a hundred percent individualized and customizable to however that fits your need. So we're gonna talk about some of the things that we should include in safety plans. And we're gonna ask um, for you guys to put in the chat when we go through each thing, you guys to put in the chat um, some examples that you can think of. They don't have to be what you would put on your safety plan, but just some things that you think would fit into that category. Caitlin, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, triggers. List all possible things that may come up. This includes people, places, things, noises, smells, etc. So for me personally, um, I'm very, um, I'm very sensitive to like certain noises and touches, just based off of my personal experience. So one of the big ones would be on my safety plan. I cannot have anything covering above my head. I don't do well in the dark alone, things like that. I'm just put in the chat some other examples of triggers. I can say that um, a trigger for me is the smell of um, like old cigarettes, like if somebody smokes cigarettes in their house, um, but never opens a window or anything, that kind of must be stale cigarette smell is very triggering for me. So that would be something that I would list. Somebody posted the smell of gin. That would be a good one. Um, else, oops, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yep, someone else said a special event, loud noises, certain times of day. Yep, mm -hmm. those are definitely could all be triggers. Not seeing a way of exit in the room or building. I really like that you put that on there because literally anytime I go anywhere, 
I have to like look and see where all my exits are. And if like I'm sitting in a restaurant or something, I always sit so I can see the entrance and the exit. Me too. It's a big one. Thank you for sharing that, Courtney. Anything else? Okay. So the next thing that you're going to want to think of Um, oh. Yeah, so these, these are really good to know how to identify not only for yourself, but for those that you're working with. So um, even if they're not triggers for you, thinking about um, what triggers might be for other people when you're working with your clients, um, being able to offer some options um, sometimes are good because sometimes when you say, all right, let's sit down, let's make a safety plan. It can be really hard. Like, especially when, you know, you got to talk about yourself, everything that you know about yourself, like goes out your brain, right? <laughs> like you're kind of like, um, what are my triggers? So being able to just understand what triggers are. And when you're working with a client, um, sometimes you're able to point out things that they don't even realize are triggers. You know, like maybe they start to get frustrated when somebody slams the door and they don't even realize it. That's something that you're able to identify as well. Mm -hmm. So the next thing you're going to want to identify and list are your strengths. Um, so that could be the things you're good at and the things that you enjoy. And then as well as any other coping skills um, that you've tried and you know work. And it can be coping skills that you haven't tried before, but that sound really interesting. And you think, okay, well, maybe it will work. You can put those on there too. And just as important as putting the things that do work, listing the coping skills that you know that you have tried that do not work is just as important. Because the safety plan is essentially going to be given to your support, hopefully. Um, because a safety plan will be much more effective if your support system knows how to help you. So putting down the things that don't work. So if you don't like being hugged when you're upset, putting, I do not like being hugged, that could also be listed as a trigger. Um, or, you know, somebody asking you over and over again, like, what's wrong? What's wrong? If that doesn't work, you want to write that 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 doesn't work. So that way your supports know when this is happening, I don't do this. So for me, a coping skill, um, I like to like ride around in my car with really loud music. <laughs> like I live in the middle of nowhere and we have lots of back roads and I like to just be alone sometimes and just, you know, drive around for a couple minutes with really loud music playing. And that's a coping skill for me. A few people put in the chat music, guided meditation. That's a good one. Breathing exercises. All good coping skills. Taking a walk, watching television. For me, anything that it is distracting works. Yeah. And that's what I was going to point out that most of the time when you think of coping skills, if you look at this, like music, television, taking a walk, breathing exercises, you know, it's pretty much techniques to distract your brain mm -hmm. from whatever is happening in front of you. Um, so some other things, you know, you could draw, some people really like to draw, you could, you know, go for a run or go to the gym. Um, you could have a punching bag, um, play with your dog or any other animals that you might have. It could be something as simple as calling to be a friend. You know, so I think um, having understanding like what your strengths are, 
what your coping skills are. Somebody else posted that they often make a quick mental list of what they're grateful for. I like that one. I like that one too. That one's a good one. Yeah, and that helps you kind of like snap out of whatever's in front of you and remind you like, okay, this kind of sucks right now, but I have X, Y, and Z. So I like that you said that. Thank you. So this next one is specific to substance use. Um, but writing down what you would do or say if somebody offers you something that you're in recovery from. And I mean, like write down specific words that you would use. Some people um, have a hard time just saying no, especially if you're new in your recovery. So having a plan for if that happens, if you end up in a space or, you know, you see an old friend walking down the street, um, what would you say to them? For me, it's been as simple as, um, like, especially like if I see somebody from like my old life and they're like, hey, you wanna go do X, Y, and Z? I'm like, nah, <laughs> I just say no and I keep walking. Um, but I've come a long way to being able to do that. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to put in a chat, like an example, something that they could think of that they might say to say no? I feel like this one's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> That's a good point, um, walking away. Um, the response isn't always necessary if it might be too hard. Yes, absolutely. And if that's the case, write that in there, right? I will walk away. Daniel put, tell them thanks, but that's not my drug of choice. Yeah, absolutely. You could say that. Like 100%. <laughs> if that's what, if that is what is going to help you be able to say no, absolutely say that. You could fib a little bit. You could say, I have like a job interview in 30 minutes. You could say, you know, oh, especially if you're like walking somewhere, you could say, oh, I'm actually meeting somebody right now for coffee. You know, these are good answers. Anybody else before we move on? No, okay. So something um, that's, oh, oh, go ahead. Ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. So something that's really important to put in your safety plan is what happens if you relapse? What do you do in a crisis situation? So you would um, put down your supports. If you have a sponsor or another safe person that you know um, will be non-judgmental in a situation like that, you would put their name, their contact information, their relationship to you. Mm -hmm. um, again, hopefully not everybody feels comfortable sharing their safety plan right away, but I always recommend that you like hang it somewhere that's visible um, for people close to you to see. So maybe not like on your refrigerator. So if you have like guests that don't really know you, but maybe like inside your mirror or something in your bathroom and have your supports know where it is. And then that way, if somebody knows that you have this plan, um, they can go to the plan and they can see, okay, this is the person I need to call. This is who they are. This is why I'm calling them. Um, and they can reach out to you. You can also put in, um, if you have a specific provider, or treatment center information, you could put that in there. Um, if you relapse, but it's not necessarily like an emergency situation, like you don't have to call 911 or anything like that. Um, again, this could be for mental health to say, you relapsed with your self-harm or your eating disorder 
or whatever, sometimes that doesn't mean that you need to go like to a hospital. Sometimes it means, you know, maybe you find a meeting Mm -hmm. or maybe you have a special place that you go um, to regroup and you have like a support group there or something. All of that stuff would be in this information. Does anybody have any ideas um, for supports that they would think would be helpful for them in a relapse situation? For me personally, my relapse plan is more for self-harm. Um, I put my sister down because she's one of the only people I'm comfortable knowing that part of my mental health. Um, so I put her down for my relapse. Um, someone in the chat, I've called my brother. It's nice to have family as a support and your sponsor if you're in AA. Contact your therapist. Yes, absolutely. I think it's always good to have like multiple things, um, especially in that spot, because, you know, if you only put one contact person there, you try to call them, they're not available. What happens then? Depending on your mental state, you might be like, okay, well, nobody cares about me, you know? So if, unfortunately not everybody can be available all the time. So making sure you're listing a couple different options. Chat lines is a very good one to have as well. Knowing like which, um, the numbers to certain hotlines. I'd like to say too, that's, um, especially the young people that I work with, sometimes hotlines can be a trigger. Like when people threaten to call hotlines on people, Mm -hmm. um, like mobile crisis and things like that. Um, So just being mindful of those things too, like if you're a bystander, like making sure you're looking at their safety plan um, and making sure that hotlines isn't a trigger or, you know, like calling mom and dad that might be a trigger because, you know, maybe they'll get in way more trouble calling that person instead of getting the support that they need. Um, Any other things anybody can think of? Okay, we got a question. Would there be an appropriate way to approach asking whether a hotline is a trigger? Um, if you don't know, I think it would be 100% appropriate just to say, you know, I know this hotline, can I call them for you? Mm-hmm. Like just asking um, straight out, you know, I know this number, I know this number, I can call them, that this is what will happen when I call them. Because sometimes I think people are scared of hotlines. I think people think that they're going to get in trouble mm-hmm. by calling the hotlines which is unfortunate. We don't want people to feel that way. Um, But simply just asking, like, will this be beneficial for you if I did this? Um, And sometimes if you think that it, because the hotlines aren't just for the people um, going through the crisis, the hotline is also to help the people around them when they don't know what to do. So ultimately, um, if you're not really getting an answer or it's kind of a little bit more of a crisis situation um, and you need to call the hotline for yourself, I would do that. Mm -hmm. So again, you're gonna put all of your support information. Creating your support team is really, really beneficial because different supports are going to be helpful for different times. Um, 
And a support could literally be anybody. It could be, you know, your next door neighbor. Maybe your next door neighbor has a car and you don't, and your next door neighbor, you know, works in the same direction as your support group. Mm -hmm. Maybe your neighbor is a support in the way that um, they drop you off at support group when they go to work. It could be friends, it can be family, it could be um, providers, it, literally anybody. If you have a corner store that you go to every single day and you know that cashier knows exactly what you're getting and you talk to them every day, maybe you'll put them down as a support too. Um, so safe places, sometimes, you know, you're in a situation and you're not sure how to get out of it or like where to go, even if you leave. So writing down the places that, you know, in a situation that you can go to is helpful because sometimes you don't think about it when these things are happening and you're kind of panicking and you're like, I have nowhere to go. Sometimes you forget that, you know, the guy down the road said that you could always go to their garage and sit until they have somewhere else to go or something. For me growing up, my safe place was my grandparents' house. Um, when I was like a teenager, I was kind of homeless and, you know, I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And I knew that no matter what, it didn't matter what time of the night it was, if I needed to, I could go to their house and like sleep on their couch or whatever until I could figure out my next move. And then again, we discussed a little bit about treatment numbers. If you're in treatment, like writing down all your providers' names, um, if you are, you know, receiving services in an outpatient clinic, you could put down um, the clinic name, the address, the phone number. Um, if there's a rehab or something that you're very familiar with that, you know, if something happens, that's where you want to go. You could put that information in there as well. And then um, one of the most important things I think is your why listing the things and the reasons that you're in recovery in the first place can be really, really helpful. And I mean, they teach that doctors teach you that when you're trying to quit cigarettes, you know, write a list of all the things you have going for you. Um, same thing here, list all the reasons. Sometimes it's hard to quit for yourself. I know that it, that it's not, that's for me. Like I'm still working on that. I'm still working on my self-worth and I'm not in recovery for myself currently. So my why is my daughter. I found out I was pregnant for my daughter and I decided that my life was not gonna be hers. So for my safety plan, that's my why. Does anybody want to put in the chat like some ideas that somebody they might be working with, um, what their why might be? And it can be, it doesn't have to be deep. I've seen whys being, you know, my dog's at home waiting for me. It could be the job that you have. Courtney put my future. I love that. Caitlin, did you want to share your why? Um, my why is kind of myself, but it's my younger self, just to make her proud. I love that. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Becky put... Absolutely, my daughter too, when I got pregnant at 17, but now for all four of my kids. That's awesome. And then someone else put not wanting to repeat old memories and sensations that were traumatic. Yes, I think that's a really valid why, because like we talked about earlier, 
traumatic things tend to repeat themselves. Um, so it's very likely that if something has happened already in the past, it's going to happen again mm -hmm. in some other form. So I really like that you pointed that out. I think it's important um, when you're working with people, um, because I know that most of you are service providers, as are Caitlin and I. So sometimes working with people, it takes a lot of desperation and feeling hopeless to even begin getting services in the first place, right? So when you're creating these safety plans with your clients, sometimes they don't know their why. Sometimes you're just the service provider that they have to see. And so understanding um, somebody else's why and being able to bring up again, like I said earlier, being able to bring up examples of reasons um, to be the best version of themselves that they can be to find themselves. It can be as simple as, you know, they have a goldfish over there that needs them to feed them every day. It could be a plant. It could be a place. It could, it can really, it doesn't have to be as sentimental as some of these answers are being, as long as there's something written on that paper that they can look back at and say, you know, okay, I have this. Um, and I think that's really, really important because all of the other things on the safety plan are, are important. Yes, like being able to identify your triggers and identifying other positive coping skills. It's fantastic, you need those things. But if you don't have a reason why you're doing it, more than likely you're not gonna do it at all. Um, so a couple things, well, we are going to probably end sooner than 2.30. Um, but a couple things to remember when you're creating a safety plan, whether it's for yourself or the people that you're working with, um, giving yourself time to know that you're going to create a safety plan, like giving yourself a heads up or giving the person you're working with a heads up, like say, okay, next time we meet, we're going to go over the safety plan. So some of the things that we're going to need to think about our triggers, coping skills, strengths, um, support systems. So that way you kind of have time to prepare yourself for that. Because as I mentioned earlier, sometimes if it's kind of like on the spot, you're like, well, I don't know the answers. Or sometimes talking about these things, talking about your triggers can trigger you. Um, I've had, even when I've prepared young people, for creating a safety plan, there's been times where we had to stop um, and go back to it at another time because talking about their triggers upset them. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you're taking breaks is needed. Um, and when possible, include your support system in creating it. As I said earlier, just as us as service providers might be able to notice other skills or triggers that someone might have, the people that know them the best will know things that they don't realize. So this could be siblings, friends, caregivers, extended family, whoever those people are that they're putting on their support system list, if they feel comfortable having those people there or reaching out to them prior to meeting with you, the service provider. Um, just encouraging them to reach out to their support system and say, hey, I'm doing this for me to get better. Do you notice any of these things about me that maybe I don't notice about myself? In that, I've seen safety plans go from one page to three to four by including those external supports. And then again, just sharing that plan with the people that you're around that it might benefit. 
Um, so this is mine and Caitlin's contact information up on the screen. Um, you can feel free to email us, call us, text us if you have any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to allow some time for us to answer any questions that you may have before we invite Robbie to lead us through some mindfulness exercises, because we know that um, some of that that we talked about can be a little hard and triggering, like we mentioned in the beginning. So we want to make sure everybody leaves feeling refreshed and empowered and good to go. So before we do that, does anybody have any questions for us? And you can feel free at this point to unmute yourself as well, if that's easier. No questions? Okay. Well then, Robbie, would you like to come on screen with us? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Let me just spotlight you real quick. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for having me and also great job, Julia and Caitlin. That was uh, really awesome. Um, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Robbie Latiri. I am the Fear Services Training and Credentialing Manager at Enlace Together in New York State. Um, I have been through um, some stuff as I'm sure we all have. Um, and something that really helped me get through it has been mindfulness. And that's really what like was the catalyst in my recovery journey was uh, um, meditating and practicing yoga and mindfulness. Um, and then just helped me to view the world in a more level headed manner so that I can really see what I want in life and what I wanted to keep. Um, but the things like it inside me and my characteristics that I want to keep and things that I wanted to let go of um, so that I could find happiness and peace in life. Um, so I, I really benefited from listening to you all talk about that. And recently I've uh, um, been, you know, slipping down, you know, we all have our days and times or periods when we are going up and we're like, wow, life is great. And then we start sliding back. And especially those of us who have been exposed to trauma in the past, it might creep up without us even knowing it. And then we're in this ditch and it's like, what is going on? Um, and so looking at the how to, how, how, we pull our, how we pull ourselves out of that, um, for me, it really evolves and it has evolved continuously. Um, but one thing that I always come back to is this uh, mindfulness. Um, so I really appreciate um, both uh, Julie and Caitlin, you discussing this and sharing with us uh, uh, your own approaches and just being transparent about everything. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. Um, if everyone here is okay with meditating, uh, gonna walk you through it. If not, that's totally cool too. So wherever you are, if you wanna sit down, lie down, if you want to stand up or go for a walk and just have your headphones in, that's cool too. But for me, I'm going to sit down with my legs crossed because that's what's comfortable for me right now. Wherever you are, if you want to sit up nice and tall, if you're comfortable closing your eyes, feel free to do so. Palms can be crossed together in your hands. Palms can be faced up on your knees or face down for grounding. Whatever is most comfortable for you. Before we do anything with the breath or the mind, just take note of your surroundings. Do you hear the wind blowing outside? Do you hear the fan on your computer? What sensations are running through your body right now? Let's take a nice deep breath in through the nose. 
and exhale, sigh out the mouth. If along your journey, your shoulders migrated up towards your ears, let's just make sure that we drop them nice and low, releasing any tension. Let's do a quick body scan at the start from the top of our head, all the way down, releasing our shoulders, our lumbar spine, our abdomen, our hips and our legs. Everything is nice and loosey-goosey. Let's do two more deep breaths into the nose, out through the mouth, nice and audibly too. When you're ready, in through the nose. And sigh it out. In through the nose. And out through the mouth. Let's do one more. In through the nose. Now just allowing the breath to flow naturally. Allowing the belly to be relaxed, almost forming a Buddha belly. Like how we were when we were younger. We didn't feel like we had to hold in our stomachs all the time. Just be yourself. Let the belly expand with every breath. And contract once that exhale leaves us. So we start to make our journey inwards. Let's focus our attention on our feet. Let's tighten the toes nice and tight. Start working that tension up our legs into our quads and our hamstrings, our glutes, squeezing the abdomen nice and tight. Perhaps the shoulder blades press behind our back. Make tight fists with the hands, perhaps engaging the biceps. If you feel like it, maybe bunch up your face nice and tight, squeeze every muscle in the body, deep breath in through the nose. And exhale as we relax all the muscles. Focusing back at the bottoms of our feet. as if our feet are in a puddle of golden light. As the light swirls at our feet, we spiritually root down into the earth. Our roots grow towards the center and we pull up more earth energy with every breath. We feel that golden light, warm and soothing, slowly begins to travel up our legs towards our kneecaps and floods into our abdomen. As it works its way up towards our shoulders, travels down our arms into our palms. It's this golden light heals our body, we hold that light with our hands. The next inhale, feel free to sweep the arms up overhead and drop the hands in front of the heart in the palm shape, prayer, Jaya Mudra. This golden light works its way up towards the crown or the top of our head. We relax our eyebrows, our eyelids, cheeks and lips are soft. We swallow one time, 
as we then release the roof, the tongue from the roof of our mouth. Allowing the body to be as still as possible. In our minds, we search for our favorite place, safe, comforting, joyful. Whether this is a true physical space or an imaginatory space, take note of your surroundings. What do you see? What do you hear? How do you feel? We allow the energy of this space to merge with our body. Wherever we are, we notice a door, even if we're outside. And as we open this door, we walk through. As we step into that door or out that door, we end up on a field in the center of the woods. The sun is shining. The warmth of the sun kisses our skin. We're barefoot in this field. We feel the clovers beneath us cushioning our feet. We decide to sit down and look up at the sky. You notice a hawk flying above. A signal that our loved ones who have crossed over are safe and happy and always with us. As you lie on this plush forest floor, you know that you are safe, secure, and protected. Even in our imagination, now we close our eyes as we continue to feel that sun warm our skin. We feel that solar energy blending with our aura, cleansing any impurities or heavy emotions, leaving us filled with light, happiness, abundance. Take a moment to set any intention that you would like to see manifest in your life. Maybe a couple. As you are thinking it, say it as if it has already happened or it is happening in this present moment. I'm going to repeat a couple of positive affirmations that we all can repeat silently out into the universe. 
We are safe. We are happy. We are protected. We are divinely guided. We are loved. We are loving. And we are lovable. We welcome miracles. Abundance flows freely towards us. We are leaving a beautiful impact on this world. Everything that we have been through is only preparing us for greatness that is about to arrive. We release the past and we are excited for the beautiful future that is about to arrive. We are exactly where we are supposed to be. When you are ready, gently begin to deepen the inhales. And extend the exhales. Slowly making minor movements in the fingertips and toes. Rolling the shoulders and the neck. And when you're ready, feel free to open up the eye. All righty, everyone. Thank you so much. Turn it back over to Julie and Caitlin. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, blend with your day for a little bit. Thank you so much, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, I feel like that was a really great way to end um, a pretty intense conversation. And I hope um, all of our participants feel the same way. Thanks. Um, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat right now. Um, so for those of you that are still on, Alex put in, um, in the chat, a link for a little survey. The survey basically lets us know how we did today. Um, this is the first time that we've presented this particular information put together the way it is. So your input will be really helpful for us to tweak things in the future if need be. Um, did anybody have any questions? I know we're a little early, but You'll get back some time, I guess, for your day. All right, well, thank you everybody so much for being here. Um, Caitlin and I will be doing another presentation next week um, on substance use disorder and homelessness. Um, we'll discuss kind of the stigma and difficulties that people in recovery and um, with substance use disorders have finding stable housing. So I hope to see you all there. Awesome, thank you, Caitlin and Julie. Robbie also, thank you for joining us today. I wanna to put in one more plug. So on the 13th, 
um, we'll be having a substance use disorder and LGBTQ plus community webinar. Um, it's going to be done in partnership with an agency that we've worked for um, or worked with for a while now, Friends of Recovery New York, um, and a couple of their um, peers in recovery who also belong to the LGBTQ community. Um, so please check that out. The registration link is in the same flyer you found this one. And then the 15th um, is the homelessness one and substance use disorder that Julie and Caitlin just mentioned. Um, so check them out um, as well as the rest following, but those are the next two um, in line. Um, and we hope to see you guys there. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone.